side. Whoa, there it is. Walla, that's big. I'm a medical doctor, not a health physicist, but I have to warn you, Marwa, there is an acute radiation incident happening right now. You have a white guy out in the, the bright sun of the Middle East, so this interview won't go on for too long, I can promise you. I visited the Giza pyramids, some of the grand cathedrals of Europe. I try not to be like religious about it, but it, I gotta say, just standing here, it's pretty awe-inspiring. It is, it is. I understand the water intake is sized such that you could build four more units. Yeah, those four units were, were the test. Yeah. And the test went successful and hopefully we will be hearing good news about the other, the following other units. I'm coming from medicine where there's a highly complex set of technologies and infrastructure behind patient care. But the way the public interacts with medicine is through their doctors and nurses in a profoundly human way. In this concrete monolith, what the public sees are fences and a whole lot of concrete. But the people here looking like ants in front of this power plant are the vital ingredient to make it all happen. It really requires everybody to level up, get a high level of education, get great specialized skills, and make something extraordinary happen. The big concern is meeting the challenges of climate change, adding clean energy quickly. You probably heard it takes, you know, six to eight years on average to build a nuclear plant. Is that fast enough to combat climate change? Well, all of this came online in 12 or 13 years. Bam, 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 one after another, coming online one year after another. And lessons learned from the far unit, unit one were applied to the second unit, unit two. So construction could be sped up, lessons learned could be transferred over and right on down the line. Uh, your son <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, just this side of my face, but... Uh... And where did you go to college? Uh, here in the UAE, yeah. in the higher colleges of technology. Okay. I did the biomedical engineering for a bachelor. Ooh, okay. <laughs> they call it the Green Island. Yeah. This part is the high pressure turbine. Okay, yeah. And the other smaller ones are the low pressure turbines. The money maker. Money maker, yeah. yes. <laughs> that color is hot. Okay. So just be careful not to get closer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. There you go. 1.4 billion watts happening right there. That's correct. And again, just magnets and copper wire. Yeah. 25% of the UAE's right. demand or needs of electricity. And you guys use a fair amount of electricity? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So everything is very deliberate when you move through a nuclear plant. The safety culture is top notch. So it's always two hands uh, on the railings when going down the stairs. Apparently, when this was being built, most of the people that were traveling through the country between the Gulf states thought that this was going to be a mosque. Um, so, you know, the architectural motifs, uh, a bit universal. Ahmed is a senior reactor operator here at Baraka. So who better than to explain what we've been through so far in terms of the uh, places that we have toured and what we unfortunately could not tour. Um, and maybe explain to us a bit more about how a nuclear reactor works. So Ahmed, we did go to the turbine hall. Yep. Can you walk us through the, the turbine? First of all, we start with the high pressure turbine over here. That's covered up. That will take in the highest pressure steam that's coming in directly from the steam generator. So that has all the heat of the reactor going in here. All of that will get used up in the high pressure turbine. That uh, pressure and that steam will become lower and then move into the moisture separator reheater, which will dry up the steam again because the steam has to be dry before it goes back into the turbine. And then it goes into the low pressure turbine. That will also support in moving the rotor or the shaft to generate power in the generator. And then that steam will eventually go to the condenser where it condenses back into. Oh. That, that never happens, by the way, no. inside the nuke. So this is just one great big long spindle turning, and, and then it eventually turns the guy in here, magnets, copper, magic. Exactly. And then steam has to be turned back into water. Yep. So it's coming back into yep. the reactor here. How does this work? Then it goes back into the steam generator, and it gets uh, heated up, and it uh, boils into steam, and goes back into the turbine. Okay. That's the secondary side. And what's heating it up is what's happening in this monster. Exactly. This is the primary side of the uh, reactor. So we, you have the what we call the core in here within the reactor vessel. That's where all your fuel assemblies are. Uh, that's generating the heat from the fission reac reaction. 
and that goes into the steam generator. So this is see, a steam generator here? You can okay. see the curvature of the U-tubes over there. Oh wow. Yeah, it goes over there and that heats up the secondary side and boils it. Basically, this is a kettle. Um, and the heat's coming from the splitting of uranium atoms, um, and it's heating up water, which gets flashed into steam, which then goes and turns a long spindle thing, makes some magnets and copper interact to create the magic of electricity through electromagnetism. That steam has to uh, be turned back into a liquid so that it can run the cycle again. Um, and so the steam is cooled till it turns back into water. We have a phase change. Um, and then the water comes back in, goes back through the core, gets heated up, turned into steam, and the whole thing happens over and over again, gazillions of millions of times over the life of this plant, which is you know, conservatively estimated to be 60 years, but we're seeing a lot of PWRs getting in the States, for instance, life extended to 80 years. We don't know how far they can go. This is the, the brain of the nervous system, uh, but there's 10 people controlling uh, 1.4 billion watts in there. With great power comes great responsibility, as Peter Parker famously said in Spider-Man. How many people does it take to run? A control room, uh, you, you need a minimum of uh, five people. You need a shift manager, uh, an SRO, shift supervisor, and three board operators. You need a minimum of that. So where are you sitting? Front row, center, yep. reactor operator, the the RO. Shift soup. You're a shift supervisor. That's correct. These industries uh, that have to maintain uh, in a risky environment, whether that's medicine, aviation, nuclear, um, need, there's like a whole science to how do you communicate. This comes out of uh, aviation as far as I know, very hierarchical. You have pilot, co-pilot, engineer, etc. And if there was a concern down the hierarchy and there wasn't a, a, a permissive environment in which to say, uh, pilot, I think there's a problem here. I don't think you should do that. That's what actually led to some of the major aviation Absolutely, accidents. Yeah. So that's, I'm guessing, kind of paralleled in the nuclear industry where someone who's lower in the hierarchy still is encouraged to speak up if something they notice yeah, something. A questioning attitude is one of our, the traits we, uh, we try to foster. If you work with people long enough, just a look in their eye, like, hey, uh, do you have, are you good? Do you have any concerns? Do you want to talk about something before we proceed? I'm coming from the medical field. We have lots of monitors up in the department. And when I see a screen with a squiggly line in it like that, that's ventricular fibrillation. I need to reach for my defibrillator, <laughs> put pads on the patient, right? <laughs> Those squiggly are not bad here. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> what would it mean so if you many. saw a heartbeat like this? If, it's, if it jumps, there's some kind of transition or a transient happen. Okay. Uh, it may go back because uh, most of those uh, parameters are controlled in automatic, so the trend will go back right. to where it should be. If it doesn't go to where it should be, uh, um, we have procedures to help us manually control those controllers. You know, we see this like modern digital control, but I also noticed the analog system on the side. If we lose everything, we would still be able to maintain the reactor in safe condition from the safety console. So if we see somebody over there, it's bad news. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's, it's uh, like live monitoring. Okay. However, it's hardwired. So if this is infected, this part is not. Right. It's like an octopus where there's multiple brains. <laughs> I don't know. Decentralized. Decentralized. When my emergency department installed a espresso machine, our productivity went way up and I just was noticing uh, they got a pretty good coffee machine here for the reactor operators, uh, keeping everybody alert. You're not saying it's dependent on the espresso machine? <laughs> this is, no. So if the espresso machine breaks down, we're in trouble? Is that... Well, there's redundancy, but then they'd have like drip coffee. It still does the job, but you know, not quite so nice. Marwa and I spent too, way too much time in here being tested. This is a carbon copy two scale of one of the control rooms. Each of the reactors has a control room. So, so this might be like the equivalent of a flight simulator for pilots. Um, you know, a, a design basis failure might be like one of the jet engines goes out. Right. Um, I probably even design basis for them is both jet engines go out and then they have to figure out how to land the plane safely. Yeah. Landing uh, gear stuck, something like so that. So that's, that's some of the stuff that you prepare for here. Mo most of our systems are automated. We prefer to keep uh, systems in automatic whenever possible. Of course, um, in the very rare case it's ever needed, we, can all, we have operators ready and uh, qualified to take manual control of any 
uh, system, but most of the time, automatic is doing a very fine job. So I think, you know, when people hear automatic, they worry, especially when they see digital, they think this thing is gonna get hacked. I'm guessing you don't have an internet connection here. No, no internet connection, you're absolutely right. You have a specific computer that's not used for controlling the plant at all, just used for administrative reasons. You'd have a computer like that, that would be connected to the internet. But the rest of these screens, they would not be connected to the, to the internet. In anesthesiology, they say it's you know 99% boredom and 1% sheer terror. I wouldn't call it sheer terror because, uh, yes, of course, there's a certain level of nerves. But what I've come to realize is actually we've been trained so much on the abnormal and emergent situation that when we are faced with this in the plant, it really just kicks in. It's like an instinct that you have. Now this is my kind of doorway, as I was saying. I like this, I like this. So something really cool about nuclear construction is you gotta dig a great big hole in the ground. The plants need to be very seismically isolated. Famously, at the Vogel site, they excavated a massive dinosaur. I believe it was like a dinosaur fish. I don't think it's called the Vogelsaurus, but uh, we'll, we'll call it that for now. So here in the UAE, when they were excavating for Baraka, you dig up some stuff. Um, I'm just gonna have to do some interpretation here. I did take a zoology course uh, as part of my pre-medical study a long time ago. This looks to me like a dolphin, a um, bunch of fat on the head, which is their like sonar receiving system. So I'm pretty confident that's a dolphin. And I think we have some uh, turtle, turtle skulls down here. And you know, as a uh, proud Canuck, as a Canadian, I'm just gonna guess that this is a massive prehistoric cave beaver. You can see maybe like that rodent uh, housing for the teeth going all the way down. I, I don't think they had cave beavers here, but who knows? This is crazy. So we are inside of a 200 to 250 degree um, simulator where you can move through the entire plant. You can go through walls. You know, there's obviously a ton of different systems here, electrical, mechanical, hydraulic, etc. And this is for anybody who's working in the plant to go and take a virtual tour, see it in 3D. Well, the illusion of 3D. <laughs> So we're looking at mirrors right now. There's a projector for every one of these mirrors. So it's all kinds of optical illusions going on, curved glass. Can we do a refueling and you pop the top no, off? No, no, no. Can't pop the top? <laughs> it's just like a visual image. So I get asked all the time what I'm doing as a doctor advocating for nuclear energy and the reasons are all behind me. Do you see any smoke? You see any air pollution? Do you see any carbon coming out of that plant? You met today some of the people that work there, the incredible human potential that they have tapped into. And you see the electricity that comes out of here and powers hospitals and infrastructure and the kind of things that we're gonna need to combat climate change. The sun is going down. I just spoke with my son and fiance back home where the sun is rising in the West. And I sincerely hope that we can be humble enough in the West to learn some of the lessons applied here. This is fossil fuel wealth transformed into clean energy wealth. It is a blessing. And the word for blessing in Arabic is Baraka.